Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. This morning, we're talking about people living and fulfilling their purpose and their passion in life and how we get to that space where we have the courage to do it. Our guest this morning is Darcy Gector. She is the author of Amazon Woman, Facing Fears, Chasing Dreams, and a quest to kayak the world's largest river from source to sea, all the way from beautiful Colorado. We welcome her to the OPT Network. Darcy, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. I said to you before we started, if, uh, if I wouldn't know that the story was real, I would think it was uh, a tale of fiction. It is an incredible journey. But before we start to talk about kayaking, I want you to talk about being a young woman who you write about your parents really teaching you to chart your own path. Yeah, I was very fortunate that my family was always very supportive of me and encouraged me to do what I want. But um, I also sort of ran into problems because from quite a young child, I, I always liked to do things that girls weren't supposed to do or maybe small people weren't supposed to do. Like I was really into skateboarding. Um, I played volleyball as an outside hitter in college, which is not something that short women typically do. And then I got really into kayaking and I was constantly just listening to this feedback from strangers, like, you're too short, you're not strong enough, women can't do that. And I really sort of butted my head up against that quite a lot. But fortunately, people telling me I can't do things typically made me just want to do them more. And then I did have my family standing by my side. And sometimes they thought I was totally crazy, but they still sort of patted me on the back and said, go for it. Mm -hmm. How tall are you, Darcy? Five, four. Mm hmm. So not all that greatly short, short for volleyball, but, you know, not incredibly all that short. So how did you come in into the passion and the love for kayaking? It sort of was accidental, honestly. Um, I got a job as a raft guide right after I graduated high school and then because I was 18 years old and all the other people I worked with were older and I saw them as being really cool people and wanted to hang out with them and they were all kayakers. So I thought, okay, if I want to hang out with them, I have to start kayaking. And I actually hated it at first because I was really <laughs> bad at it. Mm -hmm. And I was constantly, you know, swimming down the river. I couldn't, you know, stay in the kayak, so to speak. And so I didn't love it at first, but what really got me hooked was I took a trip to Nepal after I'd been kayaking one year and I still sort of hated kayaking because I was bad at it and it was very difficult. But traveling with a kayak and getting to see really remote places that uh, not very many other tourists got to see, it just opened my eyes to this whole other world. And that's when I really decided I want to de sort of dedicate my life to the pursuit of this. Seeing various different rivers, um, meeting new people. I had not left North America before I went to Nepal. And so I kind of had no clue about the world, you know, what was out there. And, you know, I obviously could have just gone to travel without kayaking, but kayaking sort of gave it more of a purpose. And specifically, it it got me away from the cities or the things that maybe typical, the things that would be on the typical agenda of a tourist program. And I just love meeting people in these small villages and and seeing um, what their lives were like compared to what my life was like. And it was just a very eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. So in the book, though, you write that you start to withdraw to the, to the sport. I, I'll just call it a sport of kayaking, even though, you know, you're, you're by yourself. But, but you start, start to draw inward and, and move away from people. That is true. So I've always been a very shy person. I don't find it that easy to talk to people. And especially as my life was diverging from pretty much everyone's lives that I knew, I was finding it harder and harder to relate to people. So where they were focusing on their career and their family and those sorts of things, I was still off chasing rivers and everyone was thinking I was very weird for doing this. And part of me felt sort of guilty, I guess, for doing it as well. And so my answer to that was sort of to shut everybody out. And I thought, okay, I don't need this judgment or this pressure. So I'm just going to focus entirely on rivers and just not worry about the people in my life. And I, my life. And I did that, I don't know, maybe close to a decade 
before I realized sort of how detrimental it was and how much I do need and want the human connections, you know, being with the river is awesome, but it's lacking a lot when you don't have the strong human connections. You know, when, when people say a thing to you enough, and one of the things you said, people started saying you were weird. Did you start to feel, am I weird? I definitely did. And so I would get a lot of questions like, uh, when are you going to settle down? And people would ask when I would get a real job and stop screwing around all the time, even though I do own my own business, it just happens to be a kayaking business. So a lot mm -hmm. of people don't count it as, as real. And, you know, didn't they would ask, don't I want some security for the future? And I was pretty comfortable and confident in my lifestyle up until the point where so many people started questioning it that I started to feel like, well, if everybody else thinks I should be doing something else, maybe I'm the one that's wrong and they're right. So I did, um, when we started on down the Amazon expedition, I sort of convinced myself to look at the expedition as my last big adventure. And I was trying to convince myself that it could sort of satiate my need for all this travel and kayak and adventure and let me go do all these things that everybody else wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. Well, the book is, it, it grabs your attention immediately because one of the first things that you write is you write a letter to your parents and to your friend, you send the, the friend Larry the letter. And as you are embarking upon this adventure, of kayaking the Amazon, you write a letter that if I die, this is what I want my parents to know. Tell us about that moment. Yeah, so we were in Lima, Peru, preparing to actually go to the source of the Amazon when I wrote that letter. And in the week that we had spent in Lima doing last minute logistics, I really started to realize just how dangerous certain sections of this expedition were going to be. And I was very comfortable with the the dangers that the river presented because I had been kayaking almost two decades and, you know, had spent a lot of time around rivers and knew those dangers quite well. But then there was this whole human factor that I was very uncomfortable with because number one, I didn't understand them very well and they weren't going to understand what we were doing. And I just came to a big part of me sort of believed that there was a chance we wouldn't make it out of there alive. And for whatever reason, I decided to still go, which I knew was sort of an irresponsible decision in terms of my responsibility to my family. But I did want them to know that I had no regrets in my life. I had done everything that I wanted to do. And that if something happened to me, I wanted them to at least have the solace of knowing that I did my best. I lived my life to the fullest while I was there. Really, my takeaway was I died doing what I love. Yeah, I, I died pursuing my passions. You know, one of my greatest fears is walking away from challenges. You know, mm. the Amazon was no different. I was really weighing whether it was worth the risks. And I decided I would feel worse in the end if I didn't try than if I tried and, and failed for whatever reason. So when you're thinking about taking on this river that has taken so many lives that you write about in the book, what's that, par that conversation like with your parents? I didn't have an open and ominous conversation with them. No? I, uh, no, I, my mom is a big worrier sort of in general. And so I just thought it would be way too much stress to put on to them. And so what did they think really you were doing? Well, they knew about the expedition, but I did not talk to them about um, all the people that had been murdered recently, for example. Right. I, I chose not to disclose that information. And so they were, you know, they knew that there would be dangers, but they just sort of accepted it. Okay, this is one more river adventure she has to go do. And I think they were also very aware that if they tried to talk me out of it or tried to make me stay home, that I would be unhappy. And they were quite adventuresome, you know, in their younger years, too. So they really understood why it was important to me and they didn't try to talk me out of it, luckily. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you write about in the book and for anybody that's taking on an adventure like this, you know that there's got to be an adrenaline that causes you to want to do the next big thing. And you, you talk about being an adrenaline junkie. 
Yeah, I, um, I, I struggle with this, the idea of this quite a lot because there is obviously the chemical factor of your brain and, you know, this idea that once you have a taste of it, you want more and more and more. And, um, but I also don't like the idea of looking at it as like, I'm just chasing the next high because it's all, you know, it's all a lot of work, a lot of logistical planning, a lot of um, really deep thinking about the risks versus rewards and am I up for the, up for the job. And so it's, it's as much, um, facing a challenge and going into all the work entailed in overcoming that challenge as it is about chasing the adrenaline rush, I guess, if that makes sense. Wow. So you you write about you and your partner and y'all have this business that eventually y- you move past the business and you collectively come together and you're going to you're going to kayak the Amazon, but not without immense challenges and then you have there's going to be three of you your your boyfriend and and your your friend that's going to kayak this river so tell us about the conversation that goes on because your life's partner wasn't really sold on the idea of doing it yeah, it was interesting how it all came about because the so the idea for the expedition was David Midgley's idea. And so he's the third person in this equation. And he uh, is a brilliant computer programmer who worried he was wasting his life sitting behind a computer writing code. And he thought if he had one big adventure, his life would be well-rounded and he would feel feel fulfilled. So he started coming to our company. We ran, we run kayaking trips in Ecuador and he needed to become an expert kayaker in order to be able to survive the whitewater in the headwaters of the Amazon. And he had never kayaked before when he came up with this idea. So it's really um, an incredible testament to what hard work and dedication can, where hard work and dedication can take someone. So Midge is his nickname. I'll call him Midge. He is a very like numbers driven guy, st- statistical guy. And he was looking for his one big adventure. He thought about climbing Everest, but too many people had done that. He decided he thought about sailing around the world, same thing overdone. And then he came across the statistic that more people had walked on the moon than had descended the Amazon river from source to sea. And he was totally captivated by this statistic. And then he dug in further and realized that no one had kayaked the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So everyone else who had done it had either rafted or hiked around the white water. So he decided like this could be his mark on the world. He would be the first guy to kayak the Amazon. And he just knew it would take a ton of work to get there. So he did train for a decade, you know, 10 years of learning to become an expert kayaker. He took jungle survival courses. He ran marathons to get in shape and he did it and he successfully kayaked one of the hardest whitewater rivers on earth which is truly remarkable when he came to us in ecuador Mm -hmm. i just thought this guy is crazy and there's no way he'll be able to do this he he was not naturally athletic he was not fit at all and yeah when he first came down you know i said yeah we'll try to train you but in my mind i'm thinking there's no way this guy will succeed and then watching him stick with it and work so hard for it and every year he got better and better until on the 10th year he truly was a class 5 kayaker which is the highest classification of runnable whitewater and when we were out there uh, running the whitewater it was quite challenging for for don and i and you know like you said we spend our entire lives running whitewater rivers and we were just so amazed and so encouraging of Midge because he he kept his mind strong and his body strong, which in when you're running that difficult of whitewater, you can't let fear take over your thinking. You can't panic. You have to be so mentally strong. And he did it. And it was truly incredible to watch. So what, what were you and 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 Don saying, you know, as you go over the years, you, you watch him and and you see him grow what are y'all saying, you know, about his progression? Well, um, yeah, like I said, we were very doubtful at the beginning. And I know for me, the big turning point when I started to really believe that he would do it was maybe five years in. 
And um, he, like I said, he's really good with computers and we, our business was not on Facebook yet. And Midge was a heavy smoker. And so Midge and I made a deal that he would quit smoking if I opened a Facebook account and we shook on it. And he came back the next year and he had quit smoking. And I knew for him to take that step meant like a whole nother level of dedication. And that's when really Don and I both started to believe in him more and yeah, like I said, we just watched him get better and better. And we're like, yeah, this is this is really going to happen. This guy is doing this. And it's it was very cool to watch and be a part of. And so this is his goal to to kayak the Amazon. When do you and Don buy into, OK, we're going to go with you. So pretty early on, he asked us if we would come with him for the whitewater sections. And that was about 25 days of the expedition out of 148 days total. And so, yeah, we, we quite early said, yeah, that would be great. You know, we'd love to come help you for the whitewater. And then as the expedition And when you got- say help him for the whitewater, what is exactly does that mean? Because there's a whole so, verbiage and a whole, a whole lifestyle to kayak, kayaking. <laughs> Yeah, so it's one thing to have the technical skills to kayak the world's hardest whitewater. And then there's a whole nother set of skills. So we were all running a river that none of us had ever been down before. We didn't know what was around the next corner or what the rapids were like. So, you know, being able to climb out of your boat and scout the rapids and see a safe line through is a whole nother set of skills. And sometimes you can't just climb out of your boat. You know, sometimes you have to literally climb a cliff or haul boats up if you need to get around. And Midge uh, had built the skills to kayak that whitewater, but he was still uh, a little bit lacking in what we call like expedition skills, which Mm -hmm. encompasses all the rest of it. And so Don and I would go to help him scout out the river, to help him pick safe lines. Mm -hmm. And then also if you're running a particular dangerous spot, you know, you can have one person on shore with like a safety rope while other, but the other person maybe would lead him through. And so even though it's it's very individual and the fact that you're in your own boat and you're paddling by yourself, kayaking is very much a team sport of, you know, helping the whole team move safely down the river. Mm -hmm. So that was going to be Don and my role. But maybe about a year before we set off, Don pulled me aside one night and he said, you know, are you really going to be okay saying goodbye to Midge when the whitewater ends and going home? Because you could have a chance to become the first woman to kayak the Amazon if we stay with him and do the whole thing. (laughs) And Don is a very meticulous thinker and decision maker. And before he decides on anything, he will um, examine and study every conceivable possibility. Wow. And I am a very uh, flippant decision maker. I don't, I just like to make decisions quickly and I don't consider everything. And mm-hmm. so obviously we butt heads a lot about this, but I had just said, yeah, Midge, we'll do the whitewater. That sounds fine. And that was sort of like the end of the thought process in my mind. And then when Don said this, because it was just one of the possibilities that he could consider, I sort of embarrassingly said, yeah, I had not considered that, but it would be awesome to be the first woman to kayak the Amazon. So I almost as soon as he said that, I was like, yes, I'm on board. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of immediately started backpedaling. He was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) (laughs) Like, are you sure you want to do this? Mm -hmm. And from the, like I said, from the second he said it, I was sure. And he wasn't super excited about it, but he did he decided that he wanted to go and help us do it. Mm-hmm. And so tell tell us what goes into, because you you'd been kayaking for really the most part of your adult life and, and, and your younger life. So now you're going to take on the Amazon River. What has to happen mentally and physically to prepare for such a long expedition? So the physically speaking, we were pretty well prepared for it because our winters in Ecuador, we typically kayak about 120 days in a row without a day off because we just have a four month season and we work every day. And so we were pretty used to that. And physically, we were ready for it. I was very ill-equipped mentally. I would come to learn for an expedition this long. And, you know, previous to the Amazon, you know, the longest time I had spent on a single river was 12 days. 
And so on the Amazon, we spent 148 days. <clears throat> and there's just a whole lot of stuff that comes with that, including it was just the three of us on the expedition. So we're spending every waking moment together. And it's hard to stay civil and friendly sometimes, you know, when you're tired, mm -hmm. you're exhausted, maybe things aren't going well. And so the, yeah, the mental aspect for me became the most challenging to keep my patience, to be nice to Midge when he was frustrating me. And I, I didn't do a very good job quite often. I mean, it, I struggled with that the most on the expedition. There are a lot of obstacles that you write about in the book and people have been killed on the river. So you know this and, and you're having to logistically set up your path. What makes you forge on knowing that death might be imminent? So, yeah, it was a complicated series of events for me to decide to do the whole thing. Um, like you said, it was like it's an enormous logistical challenge to set everything up from food drops to importing our sea kayaks. There's all kinds of things we had to deal with. But in terms of what made me decide to keep going despite the thre threat of death. <clears throat> and rape. And rape. Yes, absolutely. So the rape side of it, what I ended up doing was partway through the whitewater, I stopped at a little village and went to a beauty salon and convinced the woman there to cut all of my hair off. So I cut it down to about one inch long because I was hoping that I could look like a boy and that everyone would see us as a team of three men and hopefully avoid things like rape or them seeing us as more of a target mm -hmm. to attack. Give the backstory um, for people who have not yet read the book on why rape was an issue. So we were going to be traveling right when the right when the whitewater ends. There's a, an area of Peru that people call the red zone. And uh, we were in it for about 30 days. And it's just a notoriously dangerous and violent region because it's it's now the world's number one cocaine producing region in the world. There's a ton of illegal logging. There's um, Shining Path insurgents left over from Peru's civil war. And then there's the local indigenous population called the Ashanika, who are basically trying to protect themselves from all these forces I just talked about. And so tourism does not exist at all in this region. And so anybody, any outsider coming in is seen to a threat of to these people because everyone who has come in has either murdered them or wanted to take something from them. And there's very little police presence. So they've taken their safety into their own hands. So they've been the one perpetrating most of the murders. They're killing people that are there to set up cocaine producing areas mm -hmm. or illegally log their land. But then on the other side of the violence, the fear of rape and robbery and stuff, that comes mostly from people involved in the drug trade. And I do want to say, well, we put in place a lot of protections, and this was part of the reason I decided it was worth going, but we got uh, permission letters from the Ashanika people, and that basically served to tell them our purpose and what we were doing. We just wanted to travel through. You know, I read that, Darcy, mm -hmm. but that letter to me, it just didn't seem convincing enough. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> With everything that, that they had have endured, uh, you know, as a population, I was like, is that letter going to be enough? Well, we sort of w wondered that too. And the the woman, so they have like an over ar overarching body that they've organized mainly to fight dams on their property, to fight the logging and the drug trade. But we talked to the president of this body of indigenous people and she's the one that issued the letters and she told us, okay, well, we'll radio from town to town that you're coming and we kind of thought, well, hold on, like, don't do that. Cause then you're just saying like, you're a target. Three, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your target's coming, get ready to do whatever you want to mm -hmm. them. And she's like, no, that's not how it works here. Like we're just trying to keep ourselves safe. And it truly worked um, extremely well. You know, we, we had certain towns we had to check in at and they all post an armed guard 24 hours a day. And we would paddle up to the beach and the guy would expect us, you know, he's like, oh yeah, they told me you were coming. We'd show him our passport, show the permission letters. And then they were just incredibly nice, you know, said, yeah, come camp here. Do you need food? Do you need anything? And I was like you skeptical, like how much can this really help? But it, it really was amazing how well it worked. 
Yeah. And we also go ahead. Go ahead. We also hired a, a local Ashanika guy to come along with us in a motorized canoe. And, and that helped a lot too, because, you know, we were with someone that they knew that they were comfortable with and he could speak their language. Like we spoke Spanish as a second language. They spoke Spanish as a second language, but he could speak to them in their native language. And all of this just eased everybody's tensions. Mm -hmm. You know, they, once they were no longer afraid of us and we were no longer afraid of them, it was like, everything was great. And we really had good experiences in this area. And it was almost like having a guide. How did that, did that soothe any inhibition that you had about not knowing the tendencies and the, the changes in, in the Amazon? You know, it, it helped a lot, you know, in it, 90% 90% helped. In some regards, it it heightened the stress level a bit too, because we would come to certain areas and he would say, you know, you need to paddle faster because this area is sort of the most dangerous and we need to get out of here fast. And so whenever he said something like that, it really, you know, alerted us and like, oh man, if he's scared, this must be a really bad place. But yeah, in most of the time, it was just great to have him and he knew people at almost every village we stopped at, which I'm sure, um, you know, made them act more friendly to us as well. And, mm-hmm. and so on this, this journey of 148 days, a lot happens, but talk about the takeaway, not, not just being the first woman to ever do it, but the takeaway of trying to find, I guess, that last hurrah, and, and somebody says it in the book, the last hurrah of, of adventure and, and what it does to you internally. Yeah, okay. So a, a big part of what happened when other people started questioning my life choices is I started feeling like, okay, I need to rack up enough impressive river accomplishments mm-hmm. so that these people will be impressed. So they no longer think I'm wasting my life or whatever they think. And I had a long list of uh, impressive rivers that I wanted to accomplish. And I was ticking them off and that, you know, the Amazon got put up there. Mm-hmm. And every time I ticked one off, I didn't feel any differently. You know, I still was that same person trying to prove my worth or prove my lifestyle was okay. And I, I realized actually after the Amazon, after ticking off a couple more rivers, once we got home from the Amazon, that accomplishing these goals never brings me the satisfaction or the life fulfillment that I had been expecting them to bring. But I am my happiest when I'm chasing one of these goals. So that realization was enough for me to say, okay, I'm never going to achieve this ultimate fulfillment that I'm searching for through these river goals, but I'm so happy and I feel my best and I feel most alive when I'm actively engaged in one. So that was reason enough to keep going for it for me. And the other thing I, I worked on a lot coming down the Amazon was trying to stop myself from worrying so much about what other people think. You know, a lot of people, I, I realize, or at least I like to think that their commentary on my life is driven more from their own fears or insecurities than what they really think of my life. And Mm -hmm. if I'm comfortable with it, if I can be happy with it, I just need to focus on that. And to the best of my ability, not worry about what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the accomplishments and, and, and like you said, ticking off the rivers, it felt like you're seeking validation from others. Exactly. For somebody yep. to finally validate what you're doing is good and, and it's valuable. And so right. how do you get past that? You know, I just have to be more secure with my own choices is basically what it boils down to. You know, this is all coming from my own insecurities about about my life and the choices I've made, which have not been um, chasing a normal career and meeting all these sort of normal metrics that most Americans like to do in their life. And, you know, if I can find peace with my decisions, then that's going to be my best path forward or my biggest ticket to keep chasing my passions, mm-hmm. I guess. And, and that's why I love the book, because though kayaking the Amazon and all of these other incredible rivers is, is way up there. The, the real moral is 
not marching to another's drum. You know what I'm saying? And not needing to be validated by other people because your parents seem like they were totally from from the beginning saying to you, you can do whatever it is that that you set your heart to do. So why was it important, you know, for others to needing that that um, that that affirmation from others? Yeah, I mean, that's that's just the question that I struggle with. And, you know, regardless of people kayak or you know play chess whatever their hobby is everybody has felt the judgment of other people and and it affects us and for me you know my close friends and family were quite supportive it was Mm -hmm. more strangers or people I didn't know very well giving me the the negative feedback and why did I let that influence me so much I I don't know but Mm -hmm. I think it's something that everybody struggles with on a certain level and it's hard to just say I'm not going to care what anybody else thinks because if if the majority of people that you're listening to think one thing and you think the opposite, it's easy to fall into the trap of saying, well, I must be the one that's wrong here. Mm -hmm. But if you truly believe in what you're doing and you're truly passionate about it, you just have to not worry about what people are saying. Mm -hmm. You know, I just had a whole conversation and this is the second time that I've, I've mentioned this on radio. I was having a conversation uh, with our radio listeners about people needing to be right. So people looked at your life and you even wrote in the book at a certain age, you felt like, OK, I'm, I'm getting too old for this. And, and 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 people will espouse their opinions on any and everything. Yeah. And and everybody thinks that when they say it, it must be right. And, and so I think we all fall prey to that. But there's a word that you use that I love courage. It takes courage to to go against the grain or or to 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 paddle upstream. You know, it it takes courage to to live your passion and everybody might not connect with that courage. Everybody may not understand it, but that doesn't mean that they're right and you're wrong or vice versa. That just means that we see it differently. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. And it it does take a lot of courage. And I feel like usually you're rewarded once you can muster up the courage and the resolve to do it. Right. Because I think that most people like you early in the book, you wrote, I wasn't chasing the house and or I wasn't a slave or something to that effect. And I felt like slave to to the things, to the house, to the 401k to all of the things that society says makes us successful. Right. And when you go against that and say, but I'm chasing my passion. This is where I'm alive. This is where I'm free. That doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. It just means that we're different. Yeah, absolutely. And I, since writing the book, I watched an interview, um, Oprah Winfrey was on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Mm -hmm. And Trevor said, well, Oprah, you're successful by any metric. You surround yourself with successful people. What are the common characteristics of successful people? And I absolutely loved her answer, which was people get to where they want to go because they know where they want to go. And a lot of people are being driven by what they think they should do, by what others tell them they should do, or by what they've carried in their minds for a long time they should do. But the most important question you can ever ask yourself is, what do I really want? Mm -hmm. And when I heard that definition of success, it just was like, that's way different than anything I had ever heard. Because you're right, you know, the American dream, the American success model is how much Mm -hmm. money can you make? Mm -hmm. How big of a house can you get? And her definition was just like, yes, figuring out what you want can be extremely difficult, but it it is achievable for Mm -hmm. all of us. And it's like... It doesn't put anything out of reach. And I really connected with that. And you know what I I love the most, Darcy, is I love the most that you had the moxie to travel the world and do what you love. And most people can't untether from life to do that. You know what I'm saying? And to me, that was admirable. And and one of the things that that we do with this forum is really try to empower people to live their dream, figure out what you're here for. What are you on the planet for? 
Yeah. And and start pursuing that. Life is too short. Those same people that are saying, you know, you need to you need to settle down. You need to have a house. You know, what are you going to do for retirement and all of the things that you write about in the book? Those people, n not all of them, but some of them are going to get to a point in life where they say, I wonder what would have happened if. Yeah, exactly. If I would have done that thing that I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've encountered a lot is people have figured out their passion or their purpose for being here, but it doesn't seem uh, good enough or worthwhile enough. They say, you know, oh, my thing, I, I can't drop everything and pursue it because it's not important enough. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, my thing is not important. Kayaking, I mean, who cares about that? But through kayaking, I've been able to see so much of the world. I've been able to kayak the Amazon, write this book, and hopefully be able to, you know, share my story and encourage others. And it all just started from kayaking. So, every, you know, never say nothing's, never say it's not important enough because mm -hmm. if it's your passion, it is important. Right. Because your passion is, is something that is given to you. And my idea is given to you from the divine. It's not mm -hmm. something that you just have. It's something that's in born in you. And you I can agree. make a decision that you're going to um, you're going to do the work to see that thing through or you can suppress it for the monetary. Because what most people will say is, well, how can you make money kayaking? Right. You exactly. know, how is that going to take care of you? And so we let those those. And, and we all have to take care of ourselves. So I'm not saying that we don't, but it, it's my opinion and my belief that when you are living and working in your passion, that those gifts will make room for you and they will provide. And scripture says that your gifts and talents make room for you and they bring you before great men and great women and they will provide the monetary. They will provide, you know, what you need for that for that passion. Yes, absolutely. So what's the most beautiful thing? Show us the most beautiful picture, paint the most beautiful picture, and we're going to put it up on the screen that you saw on the journey of 148 days. Ooh, that, that's tough. But the first thing that popped into my mind is starting, uh, well, starting on day 30 of the expedition and almost all the way to the end, we saw pink Amazonian river dolphins almost oh. every day. And before the trip, um, I had read the book called Running the Amazon by Joe Kane about the first ever source to see, which happened in 1985. And they saw very few pink dolphins and they, he had worried they were going extinct. So I went into this expedition just really hoping we would see one. And then we got to see them almost every day it was so amazing. And it, they had almost perfect timing, you know, when we were really tired or mm -hmm. we were fighting with each other or kind of at our lowest moment every day, we would see these creatures mm. surface and they just brought a smile to all of our faces. And it was so great to see them. And now when I think of the Amazon, like they are one of my fondest memories for sure. Do you think that the, that was the universe telling you that you're going to be okay? Maybe trying to give me yeah, a little more hope. I, I easily can go down the path, especially environmentally thinking of like, oh yeah, they're probably extinct. We're doing everything to ruin the earth. And yeah, maybe it was a way of sending me like, don't give up, don't lose hope. We can, we can do this. Mm, amazing. And so what's next for you, Darcy? So the book took up was a whole adventure in and of itself, writing it and getting it published. So that took up about the last six years of my life but how, how did you get it, how did you get it published um through banging my head against the wall a lot and a lot of rejections no i when i started writing the book i had no clue what a literary agent was and that you even needed one to get a book but i i started learning more about the process and so i started pitching to literary agents um, my story i had i had already written the complete book by this point and um Finally, I got a couple agents that expressed interest in it. And um, I signed with one first and I was with her for 18 months, but she couldn't sell it to a publisher. So we just racked up tons of rejection letters. And then I switched to another one. And um, yeah, for whatever reason, she was awesome. And within like 10 days of signing with her, she got me four offers from publishers. 
And, but it was like about a three year long process. Like once the book was written to keep at it and try for the publisher. And I almost gave up a few times and just went for the self-publishing route. But I had, I luckily had a few people saying, no, someone will buy this. You, you know, you, you've already had 50 rejection. That's fine. But you just need one person to say yes. And uh, Pegasus mm. books did. And they really liked the story. And yeah, I feel very fortunate that we found each other. Mm -hmm. How cathartic was it for you to write the book after you'd lived it? Um, it was it was quite good. I guess it was mixed emotions. So um, all of the group dynamic stuff in the book is it's all true. And I actually sort of dumbed it down a little bit, or I didn't put the worst parts in the book, but I wouldn't have chosen to focus on that part as much as I did, except a lot of the feedback was, you know, you need more conflict in the story. You need more tension and stuff. And so I, I feel a little bit bad that I focus so much attention to that. And if I was to write it again, I think I would uh, really minimize that because it's not, it's not the number one thing that I remember now when looking back on the expedition. And I hope that readers don't come away from the book thinking, oh, all they did was fight the whole time. Well, um, you can imagine 148 days, you're going to have some challenges. You're freezing yeah, sure. at one point, you're, you're hot <laughs> at the next, you're hungry, you're tired. You know, so a lot of conflict, but it, it's an incredible story of the human spirit. Well, thank you. And yeah, the cathartic part for me was um, I'm I am pretty introspective, but I'm very shy about sharing it with others. And this book forced me to do sort of a deep dive into my own feelings about my life and what I'm going to do moving forward and then forced me to put it into this book and really open up about it. And mm -hmm. it was it was like ripping my fingernails off at first, but once I got started, I was like, okay, I can do this. And it actually ended up feeling really good to do mm -hmm. it. And the connections I've made through the book have really been amazing. You know, I never, like I said, I've been a very open person and just to meet these amazing people like yourself, make these connections, have interviews like this. It, it feels really good. Mm. What's next for you? Don and I, whenever Canada will let us back in after the COVID-19, we're going to go to Northern British Columbia and do source to sea on the three major rivers that come off the sacred headwaters plateau up there. And uh, how long yeah, is that going to take? So each river is between three and 400 miles long, and it's all a combination. Each of them has sections of hard white water and sections of flat water. So I think it'll be about a three month project altogether. And uh, it's just a part of the world we both really love. We want to spend more time in and doing the Amazon, the entire Amazon was the first time either of us had seen a river from its beginning all the way to the ocean. And it was a pretty mm. magical experience, you know, really getting to know a whole river. So we want to do a bit more of that. Mm -hmm. Will you take us on a journey vicariously? Because most of us will never, <laughs> <laughs> never uh, <laughs> kayak in a river probably in life. So it, it is a way that we can live vicariously through your pictures and your vision and your passion. Thank you for that. Before right. you've got to go tell people how they can get Amazon woman. Well, I would encourage everyone to support your local bookstore if they're carrying Amazon woman. Um, if they don't have it, you can buy it off my website, which is amazonwoman.net. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can buy it on amazon.com if you want as well. And if your local bookstore is not carrying it, ask them to order it. Yes, that would be awesome. Darcy, safe, safe travels <laughs> on your next thank adventures. You. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much and have a great day. Indeed. Hey, everybody, stay on point. We're back after this.